You're listening to The Dirt on the Past, a show on history and archaeology and why it matters today. You can find us on the Extreme History Project website and also on kgbm.org. Thanks for listening. Welcome to The Dirt on the Past from the Extreme History Project and KGBM Community Radio. Whether digging up a site or dusting off the archives, we bring you some of the most fascinating and cutting-edge research in history and archaeology and discuss why it matters today. Join me, Nancy Mahoney, alongside co-host Crystal Alegria, as we converse with anthropologists, archaeologists, and historians about how they bring the past alive. Welcome to this week's edition of the show. I'm Nancy. And I'm Crystal. And we're the co-hosts of The Dirt on the Past. This week, we are at the Extreme History Headquarters, speaking via Zoom with author and columnist for the Houston Chronicle, Chris Tomlinson, about his newest book, Forget the Alamo, The Rise and Fall of an American Myth. We're super excited to talk with Mr. Tomlinson. But first, Crystal, I want to check in. How was your week? It's getting close to Christmas. I know. We're we're heading into the holidays, and we've had a lot of holiday events here at the Extreme History Project. We had an open house this weekend, which was wonderful. Great to see a lot of people come in and say hello. Um, of course, we didn't have our open house last year, so we haven't seen some of these folks for a year or so. So it was really great to reconnect with the community and really have a chance to see people during the holiday season. And so that open house was wonderful. We've done some um, books sales within our bookshop and we've been um, doing some book readings. So it's just it's just been great. It's been a great start to the holidays. Felt like almost a normal holiday almost, season. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I hear great. Bozeman was out and about because it was Christmas stroll yep. on December yep, 4th. Same night as the open house. Super yep. busy downtown. Yep. People were shopping like crazy and doing that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I heard I was preparing for an open house right. in my house, which right. you came to <laughs> came after. To later. So right. that was a lot of fun. Um, we were exhausted the next day. I bet. <laughs> yeah. And now we are well stocked with wine, which is yeah. wonderful. Oh, good, yes. good. Yeah. Well, so when, how was your week been, Nancy? Week was good, and mainly it's been getting ready to um, head off to South Africa to oh, yeah, see that's Ian's right. family. Yeah. And so part of that was getting my booster shot, which oh, meant... Yeah. Um, I was down yesterday. We were (laughs) were supposed to have a meeting and I couldn't make it. (laughs) I was down from the booster and I'm I'm bounced back today. So it's all good. Good. So we're going to fly right into the Omicron vortex and um, hopefully (laughs) not get it and not bring it back. So yeah. Most importantly, not bring it back. (laughs) So I'll be there. I'll be there for three weeks. So we'll be looking at a little bit of a hiatus here in our podcast. Yeah. 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 We'll have about a, probably when all is said and done, we'll probably have a a three-week hiatus from the podcast um, over the holidays, but then we'll be back right back in January. Yep. So yep. speaking of the podcast, we should get yeah. back to we our should guest. we should yeah. So we are so glad to have you with us today, Chris. Welcome. Oh, thanks for inviting me. So, Chris, I want to start off as we always do by telling our listeners a little bit about you, Chris Thomas. Mm, we're going to cut that right there. Okay. <laughs> Chris Tomlinson is a columnist covering topics such as business, energy, and economics for the Houston Chronicle since 1940. Mm. Boy, I'm really struggling today. Okay. (laughs) It's it's the booster. booster. It's the booster. Okay. (laughs) Chris Tomlinson is a columnist who has been covering topics such as business, energy, and economics for the Houston Chronicle since 2014. Before joining the Chronicle, he spent 20 years with the Associated Press reporting on politics, economics, conflicts, and natural disasters from more than 30 countries in Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. He served as in the U.S. military as an analyst from 1983 to 1990 and drew on that experience later when he covered the 2001 invasion of Afghanistan and the 2003 invasion of Iraq for the AP. Chris has received recognition for his journalism, including the Military Reporters and Editors Award for Distinguished Reporting in 2004, and the International Reporting Award from the New York Association of Black Journalists in 2008. In 2009, he was named a fellow in journalism at the Robert Strauss Center for International Security Studies and Law. Chris also teaches writing at the University of Texas in the Department of Journalism and the LBJ School of Public Affairs. And he is the author of not one, but two New York Times bestsellers, Tomlinson Hill, The Remarkable Story of Two Families Who Share the Tomlinson Name, 
One White, One Black, and the most recent book, which he co-authored, Forget the Alamo, The Rise and Fall of an American Myth. Well, welcome, Chris. I'm really, I really want to read your other book as well, The Tomlinson Hill. That sounds fascinating. Um, we wanted to start off by asking you a little bit about how you became interested in your field of study, which is journalism, which you focus on politics, conflicts, economics, and natural disasters, as well, of course, as Texas history. And so, um, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about how you became interested in journalism and decided to pursue it as a career, but also your interest in history, especially Texas history and writing books about Texas history. Well, you know, I, I don't write about all those things anymore. They've kind of evolved over the years. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a circuitous path that, you know, I've been very fortunate to follow um, all over the world. Um, you know, I did not study journalism in college. I studied humanities. And uh, after being a soldier for seven years, um, I was a little bored after finishing my undergraduate. So when a friend invited me to go join the revolution in South Africa against apartheid, I um, jumped on a plane and discovered that the last thing the African National Congress or Mkunte Wasiswe were really interested in was a white guy from Texas. Um, but I did stumble across a, a Japanese correspondent who needed someone to go uh, report from the fighting in the townships and, uh, and the more violent aspect of the transition to democracy. So I did that. Uh, he later hired me to work for him in East Africa, based in Nairobi. Uh, from there, I got a job with uh, Voice of America and the Associated Press, based in Kigali, Rwanda, covering uh, post-genocidal Rwanda. And uh, they basically put my military skills to work. I covered um, seven wars uh, in in Africa um, for the AP. Um, then, um, you know, I thought a little bit about the wars I was covering. You know, almost all of them were sectarian or ethnically motivated. Um, the AP made me the, their bureau chief in East Africa. And from there, I traveled the world after 9-11, went to Afghanistan, was at the Battle of Tora Bora, um, went to Iraq. It was embedded with 3rd Infantry, Inf Infantry Division. Uh, all told, I was on a rotation where I spent two years on the front lines in Iraq. And... I noticed this commonality, this this um, sense of of sectarian hatred or ethnic hatred, um, and it made me think about my own family's history. Um, you know, my family immigrated from Alabama to Texas in 1849 with 200 slaves and set up um, a series of cotton plantations along the Brazos River, and I thought about how the United States has never confronted its um, it's sectarian uh, warfare, it's ethnic cleansing that's taken place, uh, it's oppression of people of color. And so that led to my first book, Tomlinson Hill, where I confronted my family's history of slaveholding and traced the stories of the white Tomlinsons and the black Tomlinsons from slave days to the present day. Mm -hmm. My contemporary is now retired uh, NFL running back, Ladanian Tomlinson, who... Oh. Um, is far more famous and wealthy than any of the white Tomlinsons ever were. Right. And that, of course, led me to think about the Hispanic side of Texas history. And I ended up at the uh, gates of the Alamo. Oh, wow. Mm. Uh, that's such a great backstory. And just um, noting your interest in going to South Africa. I had also heard stories of other people from the United States, white folks wanting to go over and and help join that cause. Um, and so interestingly, how what was going on in the United States, and what had been going on during the civil rights, you know, so many other countries were using that against us in the in the messaging, you know, following the Cold War, but to have people go over and then and then you find you don't really have a place there. It's it's wonderful that you were able to find journalism, my husband being from there, grew up so sheltered that he ended up 
leaving South Africa rather than be forced to patrol the townships and get involved in that, which is you had to do mandatory service. Mm -hmm. So he ended up coming to America. He had American citizenship through his mom. Um, But it is a very interesting thing because he tells me America seems like a far more racist country than South Africa. And Mm -hmm. that used to seem unbelievable to me when he first said it. And I don't think so anymore. So I'm just I'm just interested in, you know, your your what you've seen in the world and then what you how you turn your eyes back on, you know, our own country and how we think about it. Um, So when I was I don't know if I was driving or uh, if I was at the house, but I remember catching a bit of an interview that you must have done with someone on NPR because I almost always have that on. And that was when I first heard you speaking about the book, Forget the Alamo, and that was back in July. And I was really blown away when you said that the cause of the war essentially was slavery and that slave economy. And it was just one of those things where I started to think, well, what do I really know about the Alamo? You know, I've never studied it, but I've obviously absorbed a lot of whatever mythology is out there. And and I know very little, but I definitely had more of the um, Santa Ana, the evil dictator coming to oppress, you know, the people in Texas um, idea in my head. So you, along with your co-authors, Brian Burrow and Jason Sanford, Sanford, um, argue that the Anglo settlers, who are called the Texians, um, really considered slaves to be an essential part of their livelihood. And when when some were allowed in to help settle, because there was this incredible um, difficulty in settling that area, because there were so many Native American um, tribes there and different raids going on, that their livelihood centered on a lot of these cotton plantations. So um, in 1836. Um, Texas, that territory was still a part of Mexico. They didn't win their independence from Spain until 1821. So their government of Mexico now, and the Mexican government outlawed slaveholding and maybe didn't enforce it so well up there in Texas. Um, But that was not a story that I had ever heard or that so many of us have ever learned about the Alamo. Mm -hmm. I would, Crystal, you were saying the same when we talked earlier. And and we had really heard that violent oppressor Santa Ana marching into Texas and and slaughtering the brave Texans who who fought against incredible odds down to the last man and never surrendered, ultimately to help Sam Houston triumph over Santa Ana in the end. So it turns out that actually there's been several historians that have documented the role of Anglo dependency on the slave economy in Texas history. Um And the Alamo was not necessarily such a key battle or much of a heroic stand in the end. One of those books is one that you all heavily cite by Andrew Torgett, who in 2015 published Seeds of Empire, Cotton Slavery, and the Transformation of the Texas Borderlands. And that sounds like a book I would have been assigned when I was working on my American Studies degree. Yeah. Um, and so your your co-authors cite him heavily in those early chapters, and he, he must tell an amazing story, but ultimately he's a historian, and I think that book is probably something a lot of other historians read. So the data is there, um, and among historians, it seems like there's little disagreement regarding those facts and the role that slavery played. So I want to ask you, after that very long-winded um, intro, <laughs> why you all decided to write this book which is not a standard history and would probably fit more comfortably within American studies. Um, Who is the book written for? um, And what audience were you imagining when you all sat down to write this? We're journalists. We, We write for a general audience. We wanted to entertain people, you know, um, and, and educate them at the same time. Um, you know, I would hasten to say that, you know, anything that happened before 2007 in the book, we rely on professional historians or uh, or firsthand primary sources um, for our citations. You know, we don't claim to be breaking any new ground here. Um, in fact, um, you know, I write about business and economics now because, you know, covering conflict, I learned that business and economics, that drives everything. Everything comes from that. You know, we can talk about 
the atavistic hatred between the Hutu and Tutsi in Rwanda, but that's not really what caused the genocide. It was about money. It was about control of um, the government enterprises. It was about control of the economy and the banks and the government. Um, you know, it all comes down to cash in the end. And that's what Torgit points out with his book is that rather than recite um, the mythology that has grown up to justify white supremacy in Texas and the ethnic cleansing of Mexican-Americans, uh, Torgit actually looks at the, 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 the balance sheets. He looks at the ledgers. Uh, he looks at why people were coming and what they were doing when they got here. Um, and the only reason why uh, Anglos from the United States were coming to Texas was to grow cotton, was to farm land uh, that was rich, had never been uh, farmed uh, before, and offered the opportunity to make millions of dollars off of cotton. Um, this was a particularly important when you consider the recession that was going on in the southern United States and the fact that you know, the land there was over farmed. I mean, my family gave up its land in Alabama because they had pretty much made it, you know, infertile from growing too much cotton on it. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, none of this is, is new. It's just not really known by the public. That's that's what I felt when I first opened the book, and maybe you did too, Crystal. But the the voice in which you you write in, it's definitely not you know this academic voice. It's so easily accessible. It and it almost sounded to me like you were talking to other Texans primarily, or just anyone who's interested. <laughs> no, we we you know when. I mean, actually, Brian, you know, I wrote a newspaper column about how the fight for uh, for the Alamo had more to do with slavery than liberty. And Brian had never heard that before. And it was only after I explained to him how this has been known for 20 years that he said, hey, there's a book here. Yeah. There's yeah. a general audience book. Yes. And, you know, we looked back at Duel of Eagles, which came out in 1986, which covers much of the same ground, not the economics as much, but, you know, the 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 deflation of the myths of Travis Crockett and uh, and Bowie. Um, and, you know, in, in book in book publishing, there's a cycle, you know, and it's been 30 years since someone wrote a book about did it take down to the Alamo? So it just seemed to Penguin that we were, the time was right. These books always sell well. People love reading these stories. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had the benefit of having the current controversy around the Alamo today, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is what to do with it. We're going to remodel it. We're going to renovate the plaza. But what story are we going to tell when that renovation is done? Uh, but, you know, we wrote for a global audience, we were writing for anyone who had ever heard the story of the Alamo and wanted to know the truth or wanted to get angry about someone destroying their myth. Uh, and, you know, we, we've sold large numbers of books to both audiences. Right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's wonderful. I mean, we, we are all about the myth busting. I almost yeah. feel like we... Um, I don't know if we misnamed our podcast, but I think our yeah. <laughs> favorite things to give an additional platform for are the things that you didn't know, the histories that were left out. Mm -hmm. um, the the real story to me is far more interesting, but also mm -hmm. the story of how those myths came to be and how they came to have such a hold. And I think that's some of the other stuff you do so beautifully in this mm -hmm. in this book. It's not all well, about and, the Alamo. And, and that's and that's what I think gets missed in a lot of these interviews, uh, because readers come away thinking or listeners come away thinking that the book is only about the battle. Right. No. You know, yeah. and and, you know, the battle is literally one chapter of this book. You know, right, we right. You know, the first third of the book is when the very first Americans tried to steal Texas from Mexico in 1815, because we've done it. We tried many, many times and failed before 1836 right. to take right. Texas from out from from Mexico. And most people don't know that. And then the middle third is about the myth creation and who created it, why they created it and how it perpetuated this idea of white supremacy. And that to me and, is 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 such a mirror up to American society and culture. But continue with what you're saying. I love that part. And then and then the last third is the confrontation. 
uh, of the truth hitting the myth straight on. Because, you know, only 39% of Texans today are Anglo. Uh, in, by 2025, the majority of Texans will be Hispanic. Right. Um, we cannot tell white supremacist anti-Hispanic myths any longer in this state. And that's the conflict we're running into. And it's a political one, um, particularly, you know, since we have been labeled critical race theory. Uh, the lieutenant governor called us the 1619 Project of Texas, uh, to which I replied, uh, no, no, sir, we're not worthy of that, <laughs> of that comparison because we're not that good. <laughs> you know, we're, we're a bunch of smart asses that decided to uh, tell the truth in a funny way. Right. And and let people know that, you know, there's we've got to we've got to resolve this central question is, is what do we do with these old myths and what yeah. do we do with our history? And and and, and are we going to tell the true story? Yeah, just just a quick note. Um, when I went to Country Bookshelf to buy a hard copy of your book, because as much as I think I'll read something digitally, I really have to have the hard copy. Yeah. And 1619 Project and your book were both right next to each other on wow, the shelf. Yeah, it's just so so take it and run with it, man. Yeah. It's good. It's good. <laughs> I think in your in your afterward, you call this a history of the history, and I love that. You know, a historiography of this of this. Um, of this thing that we all know, and we all know very little, you know, a lot of people know very little about the Alamo. And so I loved your broad sweep. You know, you start with the Alamo, but then you really go on till almost till present, and really speak to to what has happened since then. And I love that. I love that. I um I also think the introduction is an amazing hook, and I don't know if that was a combination of all of you, but if you have Phil Collins and Ozzy Osbourne and um, all of these crazy things happening in the very beginning um, that bring us totally current, even to the murder of George Floyd, right away you want to know how is this book going, and this is not just a book about the Alamo. This is a book Mm -hmm. about a lot more. Um, So my first inkling that there was much more to the story of the Alamo happened fairly recently to me. Again, in graduate school, I was uh, assigned the book Comanche Empire. And I don't know if that book is at all familiar to you. I cannot pronounce the name of the author. P-E-K-K-A. Pekka is the first. It's, <laughs> it was published in 2008, and it and it was this. It's this fascinating story of that whole territory around Texas and New Mexico, and what the Comanches were able to achieve with their domination of of sort of the whole horse industry and this amazing pasture area and all the raids they were doing. So all the pueblos, all of Texas, and and so I got like a little bit of Texas history and an understanding of the economy. Um, in that book and realizing this is much more complicated and you never hear about the Native Americans when we're discussing the Alamo or Texas history or something like that. It's as if they they weren't there um, and, and never were there. So um, so in Forget the Alamo, you, you all really work to provide an account that includes a multiplicity of perspectives um, and which deviates from those standard Anglo heroic narratives. So talk a little bit about the groups that you specifically strove to include in in your retelling um, of the story surrounding the Alamo. Well, I think, um, you know, you have to begin with uh, the Tejanos, um, Mm. the people of Spanish and mixed um, ethnic ethnic, uh, origins who were living in Texas, there were only a few thousand of them in a couple of settlements, because as you said, the Comanche were just, uh, you know, they really dominated Texas. And, and they you were, were not sitting ducks, huh, if you were farmers? I mean, were they like, were they farmers? Were they Pueblo-like? What were they at this uh, point? They were, they were, they were, uh, they, they were, uh, they were Spanish colonists. Okay. Uh, they were trying to farm. They were trying to ranch. Uh, there was a military, um, you know, I mean, that's what the Alamo is. It's a Spanish friars mission established in 1719. Um, as we like to say, there's 300 years of history to the Alamo. Why are we focusing on only 13 days in 1836? Yeah. Um, you know, the Native Americans uh, lived on the grounds of the Alamo. Uh, There are 1,900 Native Americans who converted to Christianity that are buried underneath the street in front of the Alamo with hundreds of cars driving on top of them every single day. That's astonishing to me. That's astonishing. You never hear that. No. 
Um, well, you know, I think, well, I was in the New York Times last Sunday, you know, where yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's the, the negotiations between the tribes and, and the state are breaking down because, you know, the tribes want their cemetery uh, recognized. Um, so we have to tell those stories. We have to tell the stories of the business people like the Seguins and the Veramundis and the Ruizes, who were the elite uh, Creole families. And, and in this case, Creole is someone of Spanish descent who was born in Mexico. Um, and they were the merchants and the business people. And they were thrilled to see the Anglos arrive because these were customers. These were people they could trade with uh, and, and make some money. Uh, when Santa Ana suspended the Constitution, uh, they, like many Mexicans, wanted to overthrow Santa Ana. Uh, they joined with the Anglos to fight Santa Ana and then were shocked and surprised to find out, well, the Anglos did not intend to overthrow Santa Ana. They planned to steal Texas for the United States. And so that's just the beginning of the betrayal, right? right? Um, right. Yeah. And so... You know, these are these are complicated people um, and people who were misled and betrayed and foolish and arrogant. And as you said, it's a lot more interesting, a lot you know more interesting. Is. Did did any of the Tejanos themselves ever own slaves? Do you know? You know, they uh, the Seguins had one slave as a house servant, uh, but, it, you know, it was not. It, they didn't need um, they didn't need people to work the fields because they didn't do row crops and they didn't do mm. row crops on a on a scale where you would need uh, enslaved labor like you do for cotton. Okay. Um, you know they were primarily just doing ve- sub, uh, subsistence vegetables and um, and beef. Right. So they wouldn't um, have been motivated to kind of fight to uphold that institution. Necessarily. No. And, you know, people like to point out that there was a peonage system in mm-hmm. Mexico that was cruel and um, and not good. You know, being a peon was not that much better than being a slave, but it had a significant uh, difference. You know, and most people don't understand that, you know, Mexico had a black president in the 1820s, Guerrero. Right. Who, you know, after throwing off the Spanish yoke and driving out the, the Spanish. And by the way, the Anglos made their deal with the Spain Spaniards, not with the Mexicans. Right. So the. the then the Spaniards part, hadn't outlawed slavery. They that wasn't. The, no, the Spaniards like, were the all Mexicans. about slavery. Okay. They were trading <laughs> slaves. <laughs> Pro slave. Um, mm-hmm. uh, which is why why the Anglo's were so so comfortable coming to Mexico was because because they knew that the Spanish colonial rulers allowed slavery. Then Mexican the Mexican Revolution takes place, and the they want an egalitarian government. They mm-hmm. want a democracy. They they want uh, egalitarianism, and and so they begin the process of outlawing slavery. And again, you know, this is something that can't really be explained in, in a, fi- a five-minute uh, soundbite, right. but the regulations around slavery and who controlled it, who authorized it, how long it would be allowed, when it would be phased out, this was the constant debate between the Anglos in Texas and the government in Mexico City. Right. For 15 years, this was the only thorn in the side of the Anglos was that the Mexican government kept saying, okay, all right, you can keep your slaves a little longer, but you've got to free them and their mm-hmm. children have to be born free. And, or there's got to be, or they're completely, they're completely made illegal. But if you want to set up an indentured servitude system, you can right. do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, it, it was this constant political battle. Mm-hmm. Um, they were giving, you know, the Mexican government was really giving the Anglos a lot of leeway in that time frame and really saying, you know, where they would, they really met them and, and negotiated and gave them a and lot. They, they didn't really even enforce a lot of Right, the, right. You know. Well, in, mm-hmm. you know, in the summer of 1835, uh, Stephen F. Austin welcomed um, Santa Ana to Texas and they held a feast in his honor. And yeah. Stephen F. Austin said, Santa Ana understands us. He understands our problems. He's not going to tax us anymore. He's going to order the troops to uh, stop uh, enforcing the laws on white people. Uh, you know, he's our hero. He's he's 
what's going to save us. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, William Barrett Travis goes out and kills a couple of Mexican soldiers. And uh, when Santa Ana sends soldiers to arrest Travis, um, that's it. Mm -hmm. The whites won't give him up. And Santa Ana is like, okay, no, no, you've you've gone a step too far here. Right. Um, And that's when, that's when Santa Ana becomes the bloody dictator. Mm -hmm. Right. He wasn't the bloody dictator up until the point that he wanted to arrest a white man for murder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Boy, history could have gone so differently, not if not for Travis, who, who <laughs> sounds himself like a like a scoundrel. Yeah, um, I'm so. I just want to quick before we move on the the peonage system that you were talking about, um, where people point to that as being not a good system. I just think there are some critical differences between that and slavery that are really, you know whether it's a good or bad system or not, you're you're not enslaving sort of the unborn children of anybody who are then property that's taken away. And you're not referring to people exactly as property in the same totally dehumanizing way. I mean, I think the way Americans practiced slavery, it it takes any kind of bondage into a totally different degree. And I feel like that's something that um, when we when we try to bring up these issues that slavery was a factor, there, there's so much, well, that was people of their time are not wanting to acknowledge really how a step further, um, horrifyingly, this institution was for people. Oh, yeah, no, there's, you know, there's no comparison. I mean, American chattel slavery was like no other slave system ever, in the world. I think in that ever existed. Um, yeah. And, you know, and, and, you know, when Texas did win its independence, uh, it, was the only national constitution in the history of the world to um, to lock in the mm-hmm. chattel slavery system, where you were automatically, if you were if you had black skin, you were automatically born into slavery, and you could not live as a free black person in the state of Texas ever. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, it was the most extreme slave nation in the history of the world, and that's also something. We don't learn in uh, seventh grade history. Exactly, exactly. We like to see ourselves as the heroes, but um, yeah. I think we have to. Know, I mean, it's not to say America hasn't done amazing things, but good God, we need to tell the truth as well. You yeah, know? you know, and I think that's what you do so well, you know, and kind of alluding back to Nancy talking about um, um, the forward to your book and you know, bringing up kind of with that hook of Phil Collins. And I just wanted to kind of elaborate that on on that a little bit. Um, You know, kind of the relationship between Phil Collins, Phil Collins and the history of the Alamo, who would have ever thought, but Phil Collins has an obsession with the Alamo and has uh, collected Alamo related artifacts for years and years and years and has one of the largest, you say in your book, um, collections of Alamo artifacts, which is just so strange and weird to me. <laughs> but, me <too. laughs> but, um, and then not only Phil Collins, but you me- mentioned that, um, there's a relationship between the Alamo and Ozzy Osbourne because one day in a drunken stupor, he wandered into the Alamo and urinated on one of the walls. <laughs> So, you know, these little fun in facts. In a gown, too. I think yeah, he was dressed gown. as a gown. Yeah, yeah, he, he uh, took one of Sharon's. Oh, I'll let you tell the story. You tell the story. Yeah, no, uh, you know, uh, Sharon had uh, had known that uh, Ozzy was on a bender, and so he she stole all of his clothes so that he wouldn't leave the hotel room. And um, so Ozzy just said, I'll show you, and put on one of her uh, ball gowns. <laughs> <laughs> and then wanders out into the Alamo Plaza and uh, urinates on the side of the of uh, of one of the structures at the Alamo, um, wow. not the chapel itself, but part, it was definitely an Alamo. He had the decency to avoid the chapel. <laughs> yeah. And, um, oh uh, yeah, and it it was um, he got arrested and he was banned from the city. Wow. Uh, he ended up making a donation years later, and they let him come back and do a concert. And in his book, he says. And this is this is one, you know, this is one of my favorite stories, is that he's signing autographs as he's leaving uh, the um, the the venue, and two of the teenagers, Hispanic teenagers, ask him, "Did you really pee on the Alamo?" And he goes, "Well, y- yeah, I, I kind of did. I'm kind of, you know." And he's acting all ashamed. And these two uh, Mexican guys go, teenagers go. Yeah, you know, we work at a restaurant near there, and we piss on it every night on our way home. <gasps> oh, that's awesome! <laughs> and, wow, and and you know, and that is 
you know, and that's a big part of yeah. our book is explaining how, you know, the Alamo is a symbol of white oppression for many, many, many Hispanic Texans, particularly those who grew up in, in San Antonio and grew up in Texas. Yeah. We interviewed so many people who said to us, I always thought of myself as an American until seventh grade. And then the history teacher at the front of the class said that my ancestors killed Davy Crockett. And from that point forward, all my white friends treated me different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's um, just astonishing. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can see how to see that over and over happen in, in your classroom as a teacher must just be startling, too. Mm-hmm. Um, well, there's we, we did interview one teacher who said that uh, he does not take his students to the Alamo uh, anymore, wow. you know, because he can't he can't do it in good conscience. So there was just. Yeah. I mean, when I was a little kid, um, I remember one of the things that white guys would do is whenever they saw a Hispanic friend or colleague or acquaintance, they punch him in the arm and say, mm-hmm. remember the Alamo. Oh my gosh. It was just this joke that never got old. If you were, if you were white. A, a white guy. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, to hear, you know, someone like Andres Tijerina, PhD, uh, historian, uh, professor, one of the gr- one of the top experts on Texas history, talk about how uh, his teacher insisted on calling him Andy, and uh, talked to and never stopped talking about how Andy's ancestors killed Davy Crockett. Mm. Unbelievable! Wow. wow, you know, and that's that's the thing that I loved about this book yeah. is it really brings it to the present and shows Absolutely. how this history affects people today, and it is it is affecting people today as your stories relate, and so that's a really important part of it. And so this this Alamo, this myth, you know, that you have you talk a lot about how these myths got started and why they really become so cherished, even in the face of these contradictory facts. And I just wanted you to kind of talk a little bit more about that as well. Sure. I mean, almost everything you think you know about the Alamo is a lie, you know, except for the names, the people involved, Uh, you know, they, they did not choose to fight. They were surrounded by the Mexican army and were unable to escape. Uh, They were not ordered or asked to stay and fight. In fact, Sam Houston had ordered them to abandon the Alamo and bring all the men and the cannons up north of the Colorado River because, honestly, that's where all the plantations were, and he didn't care about South Texas, which to him was just a bunch of desert that wasn't going to produce anything worthwhile anyway. He probably would have given up that part of Texas to Mexico if he could have cut a deal. Um Interesting. There was no independence. That Texas did not declare independence until halfway through the siege. So the people who were fighting inside the Alamo did not know they were fighting for independence. Hmm. We also know that Travis tried to surrender on the very first day the Mexican army showed up. And he tried again the night before the attack because, you know, he knew it was an indefensible position and that He was hoping that he would be allowed to march his men out of the Alamo and rejoin Houston's forces. But um, but Santa Ana insisted on an unconditional surrender, which could have resulted in the execution of all Mm -hmm. the men for piracy, for land piracy. So Travis did not surrender. We also know they didn't fight to the death. At least half made a run for it when the battle began and they were chased down in the open fields by Mexican cavalry. Um, So this idea that somehow they made a conscious decision to stand and fight for Texas independence, uh, to slow down the advancing Mexican army on, you know, in a rear guard effort like the Spartans did at Thermopylae. Right. None of that is true. Mm. Um, And, you know, it's, if you take that away and you realize the battle lasted 45 minutes. Wow. Um, I mean, the Mexican army had surrounded the Alamo for 13 days and shot, shot cannon at the walls, but the actual battle lasted 45 minutes and Mm -hmm. the Mexican officers who were in their reporting at the contemporaneous reporting of the fight saw it as 
of, as an insignificant battle. Mm-hmm. Right. They just uh, had them surrounded. And do you, did so Sam Houston knew that they were surrounded and they were there. And he, did he just decide it wasn't worth trying to in, engage and send people there to help? Well, you know, Sam, Sam was drunk most of the time. Oh, OK. <laughs> and he considered uh, Travis a, uh, um, a competitor for power. Gotcha. You know, they both wanted to be president of the new Republic of Texas. Um, Houston thought that Travis was exaggerating, that he thought, you know, he read these flowery, amazing, over the top letters and thought, oh, he's just campaigning. This is a, you know, and 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 Houston's like, I ordered him to leave. I ordered him to leave. I don't have enough men to send down there, Mm -hmm. which is true. He didn't. but when word came that everyone was dead, including mm-hmm. Travis, whose letters had made him famous all across the United States, Houston needed to have an explanation for why he let Travis die. Mm-hmm. And so within 72 hours, uh, the uh, Anglo newspaper, the Texas Telegraph, the, the propaganda mouthpiece for the revolution was making the comparison to the Spartans at Thermopylae, mm-hmm. saying that they had sacrificed themselves so that others may live and calling on um, on good white men from all over the United States to come join the fight against the mongrel hordes that are uh, killing white people in Texas. And that's really what, that's what the newspaper story said. That's it. That's you know? the birth of it. I mean, it's, it's mm. like Custer out yeah. here with that's Little Bighorn. I mean, I feel yeah. like for us, that's our version. Of, yeah. I mean, yeah. every time when I was reading this, I kept thinking Me of too. George Custer mm. and, because he had aspirations for pr- the presidency, yeah. as did Travis. And and um, so, you know, I feel like these characters are very similar in a lot of ways. And, of course, their egos got them into this and and quickly got them out <laughs> through and, death. And then, and then yeah. someone else. <laughs> had to come up with an explanation that preserved right. their heroism. Exactly. So, right. yeah, yeah, we're going to take yeah. a quick station break and then continue with some questions. You're listening to The Dirt on the Past with co-hosts Crystal Alegria and Nancy Mahoney on KGVM Bozeman or wherever you find your podcasts. We're speaking today with author Chris Tomlinson about his book, Forget the Alamo, The Rise and Fall of an American Myth, co-authored with Brian Burrow and Jason Stanford. So, Chris, one of the most disturbing parts of your book for me um, was when you talk about the Texas legislature and that the fact that Texas history is taught in both fourth grade and seventh grade. And when students learn, they are required to learn a heroic, Anglo-heroic perspective on the Alamo and that part of Texas history, including William Travis, James. Um, I always want to say Bowie, yeah. but is it, you all say Bowie. Yeah, is it okay. Bowie? Yeah. Okay. okay, James Bowie and Davy Crockett. Um, tell us a little bit about what what is the legislature's role in this? How are they able to do this? Um, it, especially given that Texas right now, I think, is qualified as a minority majority state. Um, and what do you see as the harm in this constant retelling? We talked a little bit before of this heroic narrative, which you say going forward probably won't be tenable when when we have even greater disparities between how many um, whites versus minorities there are in the, well, whites will be the minority uh, mm-hmm. in the future. They are right now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think um, Texas is a uh, majority minority state. Um, has been for a while, uh, and those numbers are growing uh, every year. Uh, our elected officials, though, remain um, 80% Anglo, uh, 70% male, and every um, every statewide office has been held by a conservative Republican since 1998. Uh, the legislature is... Uh, completely dominated by the GOP, both in the House and the Senate. The State Board of Education is controlled by the GOP, and that's been that way for over a decade. Um, And they are, you know, and and let's let's talk about what we think history is for. Why do we learn it? Right, right. Right. And so the conservatives who control the legislature and the Board of Education believe that the purpose of history is to uh, inculcate in our children 
uh, Texas values and Texas pride. It's not the purpose of, of his, history education is not to, you know, relitigate past events or talk about, you know, how the people who came out on top may not have deserved it, or maybe they committed horrible crimes to, uh, to, to gain power and privilege. Um, they just don't think that's what a public school education is all about. Um, you know, the Texas uh, University of Texas was established in 1883 by 1880s. You know, the Department of History was established in 1883. By 1886, the legislature was holding hearings into what exactly tech, what exactly historians were teaching the young minds at the University of Texas. Really, right away. Um, I mean, <laughs> right away, practically right, right away. Um, 18, you know. The, so education is so politicized in Texas. It always has been. From it the get-go. It always has been. Huh. I mean, my great-grandfather was on the school board in Marlin, Texas, where my family's plantation had been. Hmm. And he was teaching the law. He insisted on the lost cause, being proud of the Civil War veterans. I mean, uh, you know, the, it was this war about states' rights. It wasn't a war or about slavery. We're still having that fight down here about whether or not it's states' rights or whether the Civil War was about slavery. Mm. Um, you know, and so it is just a, a, it's a political decision. And, you know, I think it's, it, it, it is destructive. It is, it, and, and I think it does cause a great deal of pain to people of color in Texas. Because, you know, the African-Americans that we spoke to, they know the Alamo, the, the Texas Revolution was about slavery. Mm -hmm. um, I think the only encouraging thing I would say is that I have noticed a huge generational difference between the perceptions of the Battle of the Alamo. And I think if you grew up with Walt Disney and John Wayne telling the story of the Alamo, you're kind of... Uh, you're connected to this myth of heroic white people killing uh, horrible people of color and mm -hmm. that it was okay. And that was just what you had to do to bring civilization to the, to the West. Uh, young people, uh, they take a look at the pressy of our book and they're like, of course it was about slavery. Of course it was. That's encouraging. Um, mm -hmm. I got in a couple of people I queried about what they knew about the Alamo, and you mm -hmm. you got one of these two, yeah, Crystal. Yeah. Something I didn't expect because I was expecting what they knew about Davy Crockett, Coonskin Hat, things like that. And then I, I bring it up, and right away with the Alamo, the first thing I got was Pee Wee Herman, which was mm -hmm. not something that's in my <laughs> wheelhouse. So I don't even know what that is. I, I do this a lot in my archaeology classes when I ask students about what they know about Atlantis when I'm doing myth busting there. And and they would talk about some Disney movie that like was in the gap between I grew up and when my kids were watching the movies. Like I missed that one. <laughs> There's one of those. But so, do you know anything about Pee Wee Herman in the Alamo? Oh, you know, we we <laughs> Pee Wee Herman got cut uh, from the book, and it will probably you know because mm. we wrote the book a third too long. We had to cut it by a third. To he get didn't it make the cut. Mm. He didn't make the cut, and it was probably the 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 worst decision we ever made. <laughs> Um, well, there is a generational thing yeah, there, there, clearly. Because, yeah. you know, Pee Wee's, Pee Wee's big adventure is that someone steals his bicycle. And, he, and, and someone tells him that his bicycle is in the basement of the Alamo. <laughs> I got to go back and, so, and watch the movie I now. Know. <laughs> so he, goes, he goes to the Alamo and he starts looking for the basement. Wow. And um, yeah, it's... Uh, I mean, it's hilarious. I'm a big Pee Wee Herman fan. Yeah. Uh, we didn't quite realize how, what a touchstone that was. Yeah, uh, yeah well, it sure we is. Otherwise, we cut it from the book. But I, I think it's telling yeah. us something about, you know, where people are getting certain information, what sticks in their head. Because I'm just so fascinated about how these myths come to be and then how they mutate over time, mm -hmm. but then how they stick. And if you're not somebody who grew up in Texas and gets that history, yeah, you know, yeah. all you know of the Alamo might be Pee Wee Herman. Pee Wee's bicycle. I, <laughs> I know. know. <laughs> Which is also and, and, and for the record, bad. the Alamo does not have a basement. It does not have <laughs> This is basements still, were in a thing. Yeah. Okay. This is still the urban legend that there is a secret basement oh. in the Alamo. Wow. Okay. Uh, wow. and, and there is no and, basement. There is no basement and Pee Wee Herman's to blame. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> That's great. Well, I, I want to come back and, and get a little more serious again. But you know, you really and kind of come back to what you were saying before we got onto the Pee Wee Herman tangent. But you really discuss in the book how racism and bigotry are at the root of not only the mis surrounding the Alamo narrative, but really the entire founding of Texas, and even really the United States, the founding of the United States. And we see this in the early histories of Texas and the dedication of historical markers. But we also see it in um, later aspects like the um, movies and TV series done by Walt Disney and John Wayne and their um, their versions of this history and their versions of this past. Um, I love the piece in the book about the John Wayne movie. So folks will have to read the book for that because it's, it's quite it's something. Quite yeah. something. But in Texas, you have received pushback, not only regarding the retelling of the Alamo story, but on this specific point about the role of racism and bigotry and the role that that's played in the stories told about the heroism and the righteousness that led to Texan, Texas independence. So I want you to talk a little bit about this pushback that you've gotten and why you believe it's so difficult for some Texans to acknowledge that racism and bigotry is right there in the state's history. You know, the what's interesting is if you read an 1850 history of Texas, uh, Yoakum talks about how slavery was a critical issue in the Texas Revolution. Then you, after the Civil War, slavery disappears completely mm -hmm. from the Texas history books. Uh, we know, you know, let's, let's talk about the characters. You know, uh, Stephen F. Austin, founder of the Anglo colonies in Texas, in letter after letter says, there is no future for Texas without slavery. We have to grow cotton and we can't grow cotton without slaves. We must have slaves. And, and he actually laments the possibility that the slaves might be freed. Right. And what a horrible fate for Texas if suddenly there were free black people running around the state. Um, these are in his letters. This, we're not, we didn't it's, it's kind this. of you horrifying can, in his letters what he says about um Black people, you know, I don't want to use the words he's using, but talking about the fear, the fear he has for white women, the fear of, of there being an uprising. I mean, it's really kind of awful and incredibly racist um, language. Oh, he's oh using. absolutely. I mean, Jim Bowie was a um, he was a slave trader. Hmm. He was a slave. He was actually a slave thief. He would steal oh, slaves the from other people, the yeah. smuggle them across into Louisiana uh, turn them over uh, to revenuers to collect an, a, an award for finding uh, escaped slaves. And then he'd get the slaves and then sell them himself. Mm, um, you know, William Travis had uh, his uh, enslaved uh, servant, uh, Joe, with him at the Alamo. In fact, Joe is one of the few um, non-Mexican uh, survivors right. of the battle. Um, he was all, you know, Travis was a murderer and had abandoned his wife and children in Alabama. Yeah. Um, just like John Bozeman and, here yeah, that settled yeah. our territory. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's, uh, <laughs> these guys are never yeah. good. Mm -hmm. They're like getting out of the South. They're leaving people behind and then they're starting up again somewhere else, you know, trying yeah, you know, to and, find and a clean Davey, slate. Davy Crockett, for all of his love of Native Americans, killed a lot of Native Americans during the Creek Wars. Um, and he was, you know, also a Southerner who believed in slavery and was prepared to defend slavery. Um, you know, and the most, the thing that disappoints people a, a lot is finding out that two things is one, before the Walt Disney TV show, Davy Crockett was nothing more than a footnote mm -hmm. in U.S. history. Mm -hmm. No one cared. He was like this little joke that you told in a footnote, literally told in a footnote about the uh, 1820s in the United States Congress because he was a buffoon. And, um, and, and a drunkard. I... <laughs> and a drunkard. Yeah. And, and could, not, could not accomplish anything, uh, which is why he, when he lost re-election to Congress, uh, he literally said, you can all go to hell, I'm going to Texas. Um, and that was what, you know, and, and second, he did not die fighting. Mm -hmm. Swinging old Betsy over his head. He right. was 
he surrendered and he tried to convince Santa Ana that he was just a naturalist who stumbled into the Alamo at the wrong time. And so he, he wanted really to just save his own mind at the end. Yeah. yeah. How, how yeah. do you think Walt Disney found him and decided somehow, almost more like a Daniel Boone character or something, he turned him into something else altogether? I mean, what the heck is going on in Walt Disney's brain that this? So, so at the time, this is all. This is all about creating uh, Cold War propaganda, Mm -hmm. anti-communist propaganda. Mm -hmm. Um, And Disney had just suffered a, uh, um, the unionization of his studios and a strike. And he was convinced that trade unions were the Soviets trying to infiltrate American society. And so he went out and said, I told his writers, go find these real life figures in American history that we can hold up as emblematic of uh, the stoic, self-reliant, independent American spirit. And then we're going to make TV shows promoting conservative American values with these characters uh, as the as the mule, if you will, to carry the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, Zorro was one of them. You know, then we get Crockett. Uh, there are others. John Wayne had been wanting to make an Alamo movie since the 40s. Uh, By the time he got the money to do it in the 50s, he was convinced that John F. Kennedy was going to bring communism Mm -hmm. to the United States. So um, he came up with a Cold War parable about standing up against overwhelming odds. Because in the 50s, you know, people in the United States were a little frightened. The Soviet Union had a much larger population, much bigger army. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Kennedys of all people who are like a hugely capitalist family, from, you know, it's like I, I hardly think that they were going to bring <laughs> communism. It's just fascinating where people's fears and narratives come from. And then they create their own fictions as a way to, I guess, think they're making this country better, or save this country from, I don't know, God forbid, anything that's not rugged individualism and competition outright. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, it's, I mean, Wayne, Wayne is, is a pretty despicable character. Mm. Um, when you look at him, I mean, he was, he was an abject racist, mm. white supremacist, misogynist, uh, mm. misogynist. <laughs> uh, you know, he is the, he's the picture of toxic masculinity. Um, and he was very out about it. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. he didn't hide any of this. You, you, you listen to his speeches, you see the things that he wrote um, he liked uh, he liked Mexican culture, but in a very condescending way, yeah. as you can see by the way he treats them in the movie, right. um, the Alamo. So it's um, this is something I, I think people don't quite appreciate is that the Alamo is really the product of conservative political um, parables mm-hmm. that were dr- that were that were not part of the national, let alone global, you know, n- knowledge before Disney and Wayne. And then once Disney and Wayne are using them, the the conservatives and the right wing have used them as symbols ever since. One of the very first Tea Party rallies in um, in 2010 was held in front of the Alamo, wow. and Rick Perry, uh, our governor down here, was. Uh, one of the leaders and one of the very first people to kind of set out this Tea Party idea. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, and it continues to be. I mean, we continue to see uh, armed militias, uh, I mean, full battle rattle helmets, right. you know, mm-hmm. flak jackets, assault rifles, uh, capture the plaza, you know, about at least once a month to show that they're going to, they're willing to die in defense of the Alamo Mm -hmm. should, um, should uh, leftists and, uh, or historians uh, try to tell the truth about it. So, you know, that, and that, you know, brings up a point that, you know, you have had some um, backlash from this book as well. And so, um, and, and even more recently, you've had some, um, you've, you've had a lot of pushback on this. So maybe talk about the what that is. The governor and the, the kinds of pushback yeah. you received. Yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, one of the things that we we discovered in our investigation was that, you know, um, 
the Phil Collins collection, some of the very key items in it appear to be inauthentic. Mm -hmm. Oh, do they ever? From what you guys, yeah. Yeah, at the very least, they are not properly authenticated. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, the land commissioner who's in charge of the Alamo, George P. Bush, um, you know, the uh, the nephew of former President George W. Bush um, was ready to spend 400 and is still willing to spend 450 million dollars to redo Alamo Plaza uh, to celebrate the traditional historic Anglo myth of the Battle of the Alamo. And the centerpiece of this display is going to be Phil Collins' collection, uh, much of which uh, cannot be verified as as authentic. Mm-hmm. Um, and I tracked down the people who sold the items to Phil. Um, Phil wouldn't talk to, to talk to me, but his 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 dealers, his antique dealers, would. And, you know, they did their best to convince me, uh, but, you know, it's just not there. They don't, they don't have the proof. Mm -hmm. Um, That, um, we also pointed out that George P. was going to challenge the lieutenant governor uh, for his, his office. And that would have been a really nice, yeah, bit of publicity for him. And and that turned uh, Dan Patrick, the lieutenant governor and Bush against one another. And then our book comes out in the middle of all this. Mm -hmm. And we tell that story and we embarrass both of them profoundly. Mm. Um, And so the next thing I know, um, we're being condemned by both of them um, for, you know, skewing uh, history. Mm. They don't talk about the Phil Collins collection. They don't talk about the politics. They don't talk about spending $450 million on a museum in the poorest large city in the United States. Mm that desperately needs money for a million other things. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, They decide that we are the enemies of truth about Texas history. And a former land commissioner becomes a a daily troll. Mm. Uh, We had already booked a speech at the uh, Bullet Texas State History Museum. Two hours before we're supposed to go on, uh, Dan Patrick cancels us, Mm. uh, says that he's not going to allow us to speak at a state institution at a state history institution. Hmm. Um, we have not, uh, the University of Texas at Austin has told professors there not to invite us to campus. Hmm. Wow. Uh, we've, we've appeared at other state universities, uh, you know, Texas State, we've appeared, you know, University of Houston, we've done, we've done at lots of other places. Okay. But, you know, the, you know, the, you, the new president of the University of Texas at Austin, um, is working very hard to make Dan Patrick happy so he keeps his job. Mm, wow. uh, so my friends in the history department have told told me that they've been told not to invite us. Um, mm. And of course, we've received various sundry physical threats, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. mostly through social media, um, mm. but nothing nothing really serious. Um, but you know, we you know Dan Patrick uh, tried to organize a show trial. Uh, where he handpicked uh, some operatives to uh, to put our book on trial, and he summoned us to appear before his uh, his tribunal, uh, and we said, "No, no, this is mm. America. It doesn't <laughs> doesn't work that way." Right, right. right. Um, wow. And but keep on trying because the more you talk about my book, the more I copies I sell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I I found this whole thing incredibly fascinating the the attempts to suppress um the history i mean certainly um andrew torgett's book you know isn't getting this kind of pushback (laughs) because people aren't reading it the same way i mean i think that's what's so powerful about the way that you Mm -hmm. embed what we know about the alamo in this larger history and then bring it to the present with these myths so it, it is it, it it puts everybody, I think, in the the frame of mind of saying, I think I had heard you say this on some other podcast that, um, you know, we take the lessons from history that we need today, that we need to understand today. And the way we re the way we go back and reinterpret the history doesn't change, but the way we interpret it um changes and and you've talked other places about even generationally that changes but the lens in which we come to see it so 
finally just trying to get out what the real history is that historians agree on and then explain how it got so far from that mm -hmm. in sort of this national mythology. Um, it's, it's astounding the lengths to which grown men, and I mean grown white men, will and, go to. And white women. To do this. <laughs> but yes, Crystal makes this very good point, and we've seen this so many other places. These Daughters of the American Revolution, but also other sort of historical organizations organized by white women, often elite white women, um, help promote, they, they establish markers and, you know, places of commemoration for a past that didn't exist, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, yeah. No, that's 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 a chapter in the book. You yeah. know, that's about Clara Driscoll and yes. Dina de Zavala and the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. Ugh, yeah. uh, and, you know, the and the conflict between those who want to preserve history the way it was in 1836, which was Adina de Zavala, the granddaughter of the first vice president of Texas, who happened to have been a dissident Mexican politician who thought that he was fighting against, he was fighting to preserve the Mexican state and didn't realize he was going to end up fighting for Texas independence. And then you've got um, Clara Driscoll, the heiress of one of the largest fortunes in Texas, who's just come back from her tour of Europe and South Asia and decides she wants to turn the Alamo Chapel into the Taj Mahal of Texas, <laughs> where there is no connection to the past or the truth of history, but only to create a memorial, mm. a sanctum, Mm -hmm. uh, for her idea of what Texas values are. Um, you know, the, it's, it, you know, my friend and co-author Brian, you know, he, I think he got it right when he said, you know, the Alamo is the, is the Western wall mm -hmm. of Texas. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's got a claim to it. Right. Yeah. Native Americans, Mexican Americans, the Spanish, the, the Texians, yeah. um, you know, uh, there were there were slave auctions held in, inside oh, the yeah. chapel at the Alamo. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, one of the first uh, one of the first lunch counters that was desegregated that in story. San Antonio yeah. was in Alamo Plaza. You know, so how do we? You know, the struggle now is how do we? How do we? How do we honor all of those? histories and mm -hmm. all of those voices what a, and, what a beautiful and that's what we want that's what we yeah. want that's what we wanted from the book is say hey yeah look let's 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 get together and figure this out use that 450 million to do that yes of, i mean you know, could you imagine yeah. what a beautiful yeah. place to tell really not just the story of of texas but all the complexity of america yeah. in this one place yeah. you know from what you're saying you have so many of those threads that come mm -hmm. together there that need to be faced and then to bring it present and be like yes all these horrible things happen but there were there were heroic signs on all sides there were horrible things on all sides but mm -hmm. let's tell that story i mean mm -hmm. that would be an amazing place to visit um yeah. so i just want to make sure we're clear that this is not revisionist history i hate that term and i know that gets <laughs> slapped on these things as a way for people to dismiss it this is the history, the history. revisionist <laughs> history is everything else that came before um in, in the in between so let's let's just leave it at that um uh, and chris i just uh, there's so much more we would love to discuss with you but we um we've run out of your time and um we would just want to thank you so much i know your book was out and you were doing a lot of these um interviews back in july we're so glad that we were able to get a hold of you and yeah. have you on the dirt on the past this has been one of um the ones we've been really looking forward to doing yeah well you know it's it's it's, it's just delightful to have this kind of sophisticated conversation about these topics because you know we we always knew that this book wasn't really just about the alamo uh and that we would find a national audience because the Alamo is only one of thousands of things that we need to reassess and think about differently. Um, if, if what we want is to learn the lessons of the past rather than repeat them.
Exactly. And, you know, this is a good tool to start critically looking at our past. You know, you can do you did this for us and forget the Alamo, but maybe that can help people look at their, you know, their own community's history and say, well, wait a minute, what what is myth and what is reality? Let's separate those two things and see them for what they are. So I think that's a, a it's just a great book. And um, and, you know, you say, uh, forget the Alamo. It, you know, that's the, the title of your book. <laughs> right. But really, you want to forget that those myths and really better understand what this actual history is. Yeah, you don't mean for us to literally forget it. And yeah, I, I think yeah. it's a great title. Um, so we encourage everyone to go out and buy a yes. copy, read it. Um, and, and then talk to friends and family about it. <laughs> and Chris, if people, Bring are, it up. <laughs> yeah, if people are interested in contacting you, where, where could they find you online? Uh, you know, or on social I'm, media, uh, on social media, I'm, uh, CL Tom, I'm at CL Tomlinson on Twitter. Uh, I, you know, patiently I'll get into social justice stuff, but mostly it's about business and energy, uh, these days. Okay. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook. Great. Wonderful. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Chris. And thanks to all our listeners out there for joining us today. If you love this podcast, please tell a friend and make sure to subscribe so it shows up in your podcast feed each week. And you could do us an extra favor by reviewing the podcast on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. We also have a Facebook page called The Dirt on the Past. So make sure to like that and Find it and like it. We put links to all our podcast episodes, but we also include links to articles, books, and we'll include some of the the books um, on that Facebook page that we discussed today as well. So thanks for listening today, and we hope you can join us again to find out more about The The Dirt dirt on the past. Past. We'd also love to give a big shout out to our sponsor today, the Western Heritage Center, located in Billings, Montana. They are a museum with a mission to collect, preserve, and tell the stories of the people and places of the Yellowstone River Valley and the Northern High Plains region. So a big shout out to the Western Heritage Center. And a big thank you to our editor and sound guru, Steve Durbin, and thanks to Lawson Alegria for mixing the music, and to John Chadwell for helping get the podcast out into the world. Mm-hmm.